It may not look like it now, but London is very much a medieval city. With the notable exception of some of the city's churches, all the buildings from this period have been knocked down and built over, often many times, so it can only be seen from their remains below ground. But the layout of London, its higgledy-piggledy streets with wonderfully archaic names like Knight Rider Street, Old Change, Poultry and Cheapside, most definitely uh, do go back to the Middle Ages, as does the city's idiosyncratic system of government. Uh, I should stress that here we're talking about the, the city with a capital C, as in the area of central London now dominated by financial institutions. This unit is still only a little bigger than the Roman walls that effectively defined it in the Middle Ages. Small though it might seem by modern standards, at a little over a square mile, medieval London stood head and shoulders above other towns in England in terms of size, economic significance and political importance. That was the case by the time of the Norman Conquest already in 1066, when taking the kingdom necessitated, necessitated taking London. After coming across the Channel and winning the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, William, Duke of Normandy, led his army on a circuitous march through Sussex and Kent, stopped for a bit in Canterbury when he got ill, um, but he was heading for London. Taking the city by this stage clearly was um, essential to gaining control of England, and Norman historians writing in the years soon after the conquest emphasised the daunting size of London, plus its reputation for being a tough nut to crack militarily. Uh, as uh, Guy of uh, Amiens put it, London was a most spacious city, full of evil inhabitants and richer than anywhere else in the kingdom. Protected on the left by walls and on the right by the river, it fears neither armies nor capture by guile. In the event, uh, William's knights, uh, who tried to come in from what's now Southwark, were actually forced back on their first attempt to enter London across the London Bridge, and so the whole army had to take the long way round. I'll just jump back to my map for a moment. Uh, marching west along the south bank of the Thames until they crossed at Wallingford, uh, London eventually capitulated peacefully after the leaders of the English resistance gave up the fight, but it was a near run thing and the great big force did indeed appear right outside the walls of London and some, some Norman historians say there was indeed a degree of conflict that, that took place. So London's status as England's leading city was clearly established by this year and it has not looked back since then. The situation was rather different if we jump back two centuries before that to around the time of Alfred the Great in the late ninth century, someone you might have seen in uh, The Last Kingdom, for example. Now, there were precious few people living in the city at the outset of Alfred's reign in 871. It was, of course, a former Roman city of major importance, though for much of the ninth century, London would have been a place of overgrown ruins and open spaces dominated in the West by the Anglo-Saxon incarnation of St. Paul's Cathedral. Unusual burials of the 8th and 9th centuries found on the Thames foreshore and on Rangoon Street mark the city out as a strange sort of liminal area, emphatically not a burgeoning centre of population, power or trade. London's economic centre of gravity uh, from about 600 to 850 had been situated in what is now, sorry my slides are not going, there we go, uh, situated in what is now the West End roughly between Trafalgar Square and Lincoln's Inn Field. This settlement, known as Lundenwick, uh, was more like a permanent fair of traders. I think in the book I even use the analogy of a permanent car boot sale. Uh, a set permanent fair of traders and craftspeople, uh, rather than anything we'd recognise as a town. In the course of the ninth century, Lundenwick seems to have broken up into numerous small clusters of habitation, um, which gradually spread eastwards along the Thames in that space between Londonwick and, 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 and the city of London, um, roughly along Fleet Street, um, that broke up and gradually moves through that area until it comes to the western edge of the Roman city. It was as a result of this gravitation eastwards that the city itself started to be built up again, albeit on a very modest scale. Archaeological finds have shown that settlement of the city in the reign of Alfred was confined to a really quite small patch that hugged the banks of the Thames, 
roughly from where St Paul's is to St Mary at Hill, a distance of about a mile. This was a rather a very different kind of setup from Lundwick. The earlier settlement had been connected with ports all over Northern Europe, and this rich cosmopolitan character, at least in economic terms, is reflected in the range of pottery and other goods found in and around London. The resettled city of the later 9th century had much narrower economic horizons, with far less from overseas and rather more goods coming from up and down the Thames Valley. Even so, it is clear from the historical record that London was seen as a significant place. Politically, the city gained at this time from being not at the centre of things, but very much on the periphery. London's position on the Thames put it right on the border of two of the major kingdoms of the day, Mercia to the north, with its heartland off in the West Midlands, and Wessex to the south, with the, the real power base being in sort of Hampshire, Somerset, Wiltshire, places like that. Um, so Mercia and Wessex are the two major powers that are conflicting with London by this stage. Moreover, um, after the, the Viking invasions of the 860s and 870s, the divide between English and Viking territory was set at the mouth of the River Lee in what is now the Docklands. In other words, London was a three-way frontier city. It was precisely this unusual political geography that drew Alfred the Great's interest when he visited the city in 886. The rather evasive chronicle accounts we have about this say that he restored the city, which could mean laying out new roads and or maybe rebuilding its fortifications. But we do know that at the same time, Alfred also held a major gathering in London, where Mercians and West Saxons came together to reaffirm their allegiance to Alfred, potentially with the Vikings looking on anxiously from a mile and a half further east. On this occasion, London's in-betweenness made it important, but in general, it did not yet stand out as any more significant than about half a dozen other leading urban centres in, in England. An observer of about the year 900 asked to put money on where would be the leading urban centre of the land a century or so later, might well have picked Canterbury, Chester, Winchester, or maybe York instead of London. So what changed between the time of Alfred and the Norman conquest? In very general terms, London shifted from being on the edge to being at the center. Its success was bound up with the emergence and development of the Kingdom of England, which gave London a larger entity to be the center of. Connectivity with Wessex, Mercia, East Anglia, Kent, and the sea, um, taking you out to other places beyond, suddenly became a big plus. This was a process that can be traced back to Alfred, who brought together Mercia and Wessex, but which was really the achievement of the generations of kings who followed him in the 10th century. Edward the Elder and his sister Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians, conquered the Midlands in the 910s, while Athelstan in 927 added York and its territory to, to his kingdom and subsequently asserted English supremacy over the kingdoms of Western and Northern Britain. Edgar in the 960s and 970s consolidated the running of this expanded territory, an enterprise that continued under his ill-famed son, Ethelred II, Ethelred the Unready. From London's point of view, Ethelred's reign was in fact to prove crucial, in large part because of unforeseen and turbulent events that thrust the city into the limelight. The Vikings, the aggressors of Alfred's reign, returned to England in the 980s, their attacks escalating in duration and severity over the next 30 years, culminating in the successful conquest of England by the Danish king, Swain Forkbeard, in late 1013. Tellingly, Ethelred's last stronghold in that year was London, and the Bishop of London was even entrusted with the sensitive task of escorting the king's sons to their exile in Normandy before Ethelred himself joined them. And then after Ethelred was accepted back as king, somewhat grudgingly, following Swain's sudden death in February 1014, he seems to have spent a lot of time in London. So London, uh, by default, took on a larger, more central role very quickly, essentially in the 50 years or so from about 990, initially in the sequence of crises that characterised the latter part of Ethelred's reign. These were bad for the king and bad for the kingdom, but good for the city, 
and created the conditions for its importance to be cemented in subsequent decades. There are two major sides to this story, one military come political, one economic, which I will look at in turn. So London was, like other Anglo-Saxon towns, intended to play an important military role as a defended strong point against enemies. Unlike most other towns in the age of Ethelred, however, London did so with conspicuous success. In 994, Swain Forkbeard led an expedition against the city. This was a, a serious assault force consisting of 94 ships' crews. But there, wrote one of the authors responsible for the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Vikings suffered more harm and injury than they ever thought any citizens could do to them. The main version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for Ethelred's reign is particularly interested in and enthusiastic about London, so its testimony needs to be taken with a hefty pinch of salt here, but it cannot have been completely off base. London endured at least two more attacks from the Vikings before Ethelred's death in 1009 and 1013, and the greatest siege began just a few days after Ethelred's death in London in April 1016. This last conflict had a truly epic quality about it. The Vikings, led now by Swain's very able son, Canute, dug a ditch around Southwark so that they could get their ships to the west of London Bridge. Uh, this, in fact, being one of the first references that we have to London Bridge existing, having been rebuilt around the year 1000. Within the city, the defence seems to have been led by a character called Ulfkettle of East Anglia, who was the most fearsome commander on the English side, uh, having fought the Vikings to a standstill in earlier years in his home, home territory of East Anglia. Meanwhile, Ethelred's son and heir, Edmund Ironside, had set off from London to gather an army in Wessex to come back and break the siege. And he returned in triumph via Tottenham, chasing the Viking army away, uh, though they returned for a final effort against London shortly thereafter. This rapid cut and thrust uh, culminated in a pitched battle in Essex at Ashingdon towards the end of 1016. Uh, and Canute's victory here effectively ended hostilities and he and his army chose to spend the winter in London, where they could watch over the epicenter of English resistance and bask in possession of what they had fought so often and so hard to gain. One of the men apparently took the opportunity of this well-earned rest to compose an old Norse poem, Leedsman Flocker, um, or the poem of the household warriors. Addressed to an unnamed lady, it ends on a satisfied note. Now that these hard battles have been recently concluded, we can settle down, lady, in beautiful London. Hard battles is right, for despite all these efforts and all the bloodshed, the Viking forces never succeeded in taking London by force. The Londoners had turned back every Viking attack, why were they so successful where so many other towns of Ethelred's reign were not? London had two things going for it. First were its physical strengths. The city had, in the Roman walls, one of the most formidable sets of defences in Northern Europe. These stood some six metres high and ran for about five kilometres and were punctuated with dozens of towers. There is also evidence that the ditch before the walls was re-dug at about this time. So the large area enclosed by the walls gave space for stockpiling, accommodation and agriculture, all of which contributed to London's strength as a fortress. But this meant little without the second strength, which was the population's own strong tradition of assertive military activity. We need to leave behind any notion of cities being full of soft and unmilitary shopkeepers. Late Anglo-Saxon cities, on the contrary, had an air of a barracks about them at all times, and the comparatively dense concentration of inhabitants bred a high degree of cohesion, confidence, and aggression. In war, this was channeled into armed contingents who would go out and fight for the king, as the Londoners did for Alfred and possibly his heirs in the 10th century. In peace, it meant readiness on the part of the citizens to prosecute their legal interests with relentless fervour and a quasi-military organisation of the city. London possessed these qualities in spades. Around the 930s, a legal document was drawn up by the bishops, reeves and nobles and commoners who belonged to London, meaning that not only those who lived in the city or its meaning, sorry, meaning those who lived in the city and its environs, but who also identified with London. Not everyone, it's those who feel a particular sort of connection and have some kind of tie with the city. 
These groups formed themselves into what they called, rather euphemistically, peace guilds, whose main job was to keep the, keep the peace by threatening ferocious pursuit to anyone who wronged a member of the guild. They promised to chase suspected thieves wherever they might go and kill them, anyone over the age of 14, um, with a special reward for whoever actually did the deed. Nowhere do the peace guilds say that they constitute a military organization, but a peacekeeping infrastructure of such ferocity would have been an obvious starting point for military service. London's internal divisions, the wards, uh, may reflect how the peace guilds maintained readiness. Ward, the word ward, is derived from the Old English word weyar, meaning watch, protection. Um, since 1394, the City of London has been divided into 25 wards after one of the previous 24 split into two. Those 24 probably go back to at least to the early 12th century, and one is probably related to another guild recorded in the early 11th century. It must be noted here that London was not the only English town divided into wards by an early date. Cambridge and Stamford were as well, according to Doomsday Book from the late 11th century. Nonetheless, by the time of Ethelred and the Norman Conquest, the Londoners had both a well-developed sense of collective identity and formidable defences. London's third great strength was that it stood at the forefront of national military efforts. Sometimes that meant its own considerable resources were supplemented with those from across the kingdom, as when in 992 and 1009 it hosted major fleets. Sometimes it meant that London's men took on elite figurehead status. In the context of Ethelred's reign, it seems to have been connected to the apparently continuing County. Titus was born of a unique set of circumstances, but rapidly became a precedent, leading to London and its soldiers taking on a unique level of involvement in the acclamation of new kings. Ethelred's death provided a first signal of the way the wind was blowing. The deceased king's body was rapidly buried in St Paul's Cathedral. He was the first monarch to be buried there in over three centuries, and Ethelred's tomb survived until the destruction of old St Paul's in and around the Great Fire. It is entirely possible, likely even, that this had not been Ethelred's wish. His burial in the heart of London reflects the fraught situation at the moment of his demise, the general prominence of the city in his regime, and also, and perhaps most pertinently, the seizure of the initiative within the city by a party of supporters of his son, Edmund Ironside. Three different sources suggest just how contentious Edmund's path to power was. One version, the same pro-London te main text of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle we've already met, says that all the councillors who were in London and the citizens chose him, Edmund, as king, and that was that. Though suggestively it admits a little later that Edmund had to go forth and take possession of Wessex separately. The implication is that London's wish should be and was respected. Another version of the Chronicle that survives in Latin adds that a separate assembly of English worthies in Winchester actually decided to acknowledge Canute as king, but changed their mind after hearing about the decision made at London. Finally, there is a slightly more problematic source, the, the Encomium M.I. Reginae, the Mirror of Queen Emma, written in the early 1040s and known for sometimes embroidering the truth to make rhetorical points. Yet its account of events at London in 1016 is worth looking at. It says that the Londoners initially agreed to allow Canute and his men into the city after Ethelred's death. But Edmund had been spirited out of London by a faction within its garrison the night before and gathered enough men to re-enter the city to prosecute his claim to the throne, though they only did so after Canute and his forces had moved out. If 1016 shows that London's voice was one among many on the national scene, the years 1035 and 1042 show how its say became more dominant over time. Ironically, Ethelred and Edmund's longtime adversary Canute played a big part in securing this legacy for the city. He permanently stationed a large detachment of his Leeds men, or veteran mercenaries, in London to watch over the city. 
One of them may well have been buried under this remarkable tombstone covered in Scandinavian style ornamentation and runes of the right era that was found near St. Paul's Cathedral in the 1850s. In 1035, Canute himself died and the London contingent was one of the major power bases described by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as having a say over the nomination of the new king. And then in 1042, when Edward the Confessor returned to the kingdom, that range of agencies had narrowed. Now all the people assembled in London chose him as king. They may have been there because the previous king, uh, Harthur Canute, one of Canute's sons, had died at a wedding in Lambeth, but they didn't relocate elsewhere. They stayed in London. So London had, since the troubled succession of 1016, become the venue and to some extent the decision maker for kingship. Military activity and political prominence undoubtedly brought risks, but also great rewards. Armies and the aristocrats who attended on the king brought people to the city, swelling its population. Crucially, they also brought money. Expenditure to feed, clothe and equip the visitors was likely high, so it constituted a valuable stream of income for London's traders. Those who stayed long term might settle into the city permanently. Families or individual craftspeople would have migrated to the city to take advantage of the economic opportunities. Another side of this influx may have been darker. Refugees who fled from ravaged nearby shires to take shelter behind the thick walls and serried ranks of London's defences. It was for all these reasons that London's growth around the millennium was positively meteoric. Other towns and cities expanded around this time too, but not with the same frenetic pace as London. By the middle of the 11th century, a large proportion of the area uh, within the Roman walls had been built up, several times the area of habitation under Alfred. Settlement had spread across the river too, with the reconstruction of London Bridge and the first signs of development in Southwark. Almost all of this expansion on both sides of the Thames had taken place since the late 10th century. That is to say within about 60 years before the Norman Conquest. Indeed, land was, be, was now being clawed back from Thames. The late Anglo-Saxon period saw the first of many reclamations of land along the shoreline by driving in wooden piles, tree trunks, and then filling in the wet space behind with, with whatever they could get their hands on. These revetments have been one of the best sources for London archaeology, the wet conditions preserving organic material extremely well. Pieces of ships and buildings have been found, including the spectacular remnants of the roofing of a large 10th century building similar to a Norwegian stave church. Whether these pieces of wood actually come from a church is unclear. We know it was a building on that sort of scale, but not what it was for. But there is no doubt that the city's first local churches were also appearing at this time. No fewer than 27 city churches have produced archaeological evidence for origins before 1100 and this should be taken as a minimum. Just one church, All Hallows by the Tower, also known as All Hallows Barking, contains possible standing fabric from the pre-conquest period in the form of an archway that was only unveiled due to bomb damage in the Blitz. The urban sprawl of London within the walls was made up largely of quite small houses and workshops, of which traces of around 150 have now been found. These were single story wooden buildings, most, although they were becoming more densely packed together, still having what would now be considered quite a generous garden around or behind. They showed an increasing level of diversity in construction and appearance, perhaps reflecting the growing city's varied population. Some had glass windows or timber cellars. With so many more buildings springing up, a whole network of new streets had to be established too. These departed from the almost grid-like pattern of the Alfredian part of the city. The new roads spread out from this core area in a more organic, tendril-like manner. That old inner part of the city was now its heart, the most densely built up zone within the walls. It should be stressed that although London was of course a Roman city, and some of the major roads emanating from it followed the same course as Roman roads, within the walls the Roman street layout was completely abandoned. This was to all intents and purposes a, new, a city newly laid out in sequential bursts of activity between the 9th and 11th centuries. Evidence for this new street plan is almost all archaeological. We see that the frontages of buildings respect more or less the same road layout as now, 
a few actual road surfaces have been identified. This material evidence can be set alongside a few texts referring to specific roads in the city. Documents from the time of Alfred granting big blocks of London land to bishops from as far, as far afield as Worcester and Canterbury refer to public streets, uh, which could just mean routes designated and reserved for public use, or perhaps streets used for markets. Frustratingly, these and other documents from the 11th century and before do not refer to these streets by name. Um, it's just the public street. It is possible that the early inhabitants of London thought more in terms of features and areas than specific streets and their names, especially as these were being, being put together. Um, since we have plenty of names of these other features and landmarks of early London, even though we can't always find them, we know that there was an Ethelred's Hive, Ethelred's sort of harbour place. There was also a fish hive, um, uh, both of which were on banks of the Thames, of course, uh, as well as an old stone building, possibly a Roman ruin referred to as Huatman Stone, somewhere nearby to, to Ethelred's Hive. One recent and unexpected discovery sheds new light on late Anglo-Saxon London streetscape. It is a coin which emerged only two years ago in 2019. This silver penny was struck in the name of King Harold I, the son of Canute, and belongs to the period between 1035 and 1040. Its obverse, with a representation of the king, um, is standard for the type. The reverse, in general design, is also standard, but what the text actually says on the reverse of this coin is more of a surprise. Its inscription first names the individual responsible for producing the coin, known as a, a munia in the Anglo-Saxon period, um, in this case, who went by the name of Eardwald. Um, next comes the preposition on, uh, meaning in or at in Old English. What follows this is unprecedented. The word Estchep, uh, which can be understood as East Cheap, a street in the eastern part of the city of London. Um, with the last two letters that we get after it, L, L, U, L, V, being an abbreviation for London. Uh, London. In other words, Eardwald. Munia on East Cheap, London. All that's missing for a full address is a postcode. To my knowledge, this is the first occurrence on, in any media of a city street name that still survives, and the earliest reference to East Cheap by almost a century. It is also the only known Anglo Saxon coin to refer to a street name um, within the place where it was made. The decision to name the street in this way could have been pragmatic if London happened to have two Munias by the same name at the time it was made. This is a distinct possibility. Um, alternatively, Eardwald might have identified strongly with East Cheap for reasons that we can't pin down any longer. Either way, the fact that only a, a London street name was used in this way and not one from Canterbury or York or Lincoln or anywhere else is very suggestive. It was the biggest and most prominent town in the country and had a unique relationship with the kingdom's finances and coinage, which I'll tell you a bit about now. Now, this special relationship had developed only in the late Anglo-Saxon period as well, starting from about the late 10th century. Coins had been made in London more or less constantly since the 7th century, and it had usually been one of the main mint towns in England. But it was still in the same league as Canterbury, York, and several others. Indeed, in the early 10th century, Chester definitely had more money as at work than London, and York was almost certainly more productive, making more actual coins. From the last decades of the 10th century, that changed. Minting of coins picked up everywhere, with the result that more pennies survive and show more money as at work. But at London, minting went into hyperdrive. In the 970s, there were 10 moneyers named in London, which was about the same as Lincoln and Winchester, and significantly fewer than Stamford and York. In a coinage from the early 980s, London matched York in the number of known moneyers with 31 and 32 respectively, and it had the most in every coin issue that followed until just before the Norman Conquest. For a long period, between about 1000 and 1060, it had dramatically more than anywhere else. By this point, London had been joined in minting by Southwark, which was jurisdictionally separate but economically closely tied to London. Their combined activity peaked in the last coin issue of Ethelred II and the first type of Canute. Together, the two mint towns had uh, 68 and 79 moneyers in these two phases of the coinage, respectively. 
which is more than double the number in the next most productive mint towns. What this meant in practice is that London and Southwark had, in the space of a few years, that many individual workshops where coins were being made. This was the usual setup for late Anglo-Saxon coin production. There was not generally a single mint building. Rather, individual moneyers would operate their own premises where they served as a combination of money changer and overseer of the actual production of coins. Some might have worked on a commercial basis, selling new coin to anyone with old or foreign silver that needed to be changed, but most probably reflected closed networks of demand that propelled coins between the city and communities elsewhere in England. London's voluminous complement of moneyers translated into vast representation in the surviving stock of coins. Among a sample of 50 major museum collections, York, Lincoln, Stamford, Winchester and York account for between 1,100 and 2,600 coins each. London alone accounts for over 4,100. The figure is even more impressive if one looks at the single finds of coins from within England. These are especially important because the coins were made in the first instance for use within England, and also because these coins, typically found in isolation by metal detector users, represent an apparently random sample of those lost by chance in the course of circulation, uh, so offering a good gauge for the overall shape of the circulating currency. The single finds reveal the high degree of London's dominance in the late Anglo-Saxon monetary system. In the period from about the 980s to the 1040s, London was almost always the best represented single mint town, and in some issues, London alone accounted for the majority of all coins that have been found, which is to say nearly 40% of the total. London's huge complement of moneyers and their vast output of coins reflect the special standing the city was taking on in, London, in England's governmental and military machinery, the two being closely linked together at this time. Ethelred's reign, and to a lesser extent those of subsequent rulers, saw financial pressures on the population pile up and up. These are why the coins were being made. Successive waves of Viking invaders had to be bought off with silver so as to forestall their violence and pillaging. The first such payment was raised in 991 and consisted of £10,000. That's quite a lot of money nowadays, but it's, it's a huge amount of money back then. It's, it's impossible to translate that exactly into a modern figure, but we're talking, we're talking millions. It was followed in 994 by £22,000 and £24,000 in 1002. Others followed, escalating in size, the biggest single demand being £72,000 in the year 1018, which included £10,500 imposed on London alone. By this means, Canute paid off much of his army. The English had to cough up other large payments too. In 1012, Ethelred II instituted a separate annual tax on land, the proceeds of which supported a force of Vikings who had entered English service and were based at Greenwich, close to London. In 1014, 21,000 pounds was raised to pay this army and over 32,000 pounds in 1041. These headline payments are known from references in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and related sources, but that is in part because they were so unusual. Other obligations may have been more established and so less well recorded. The constant military campaigning came at a cost, for example. Soldiers were not typically salaried as such, but they did receive money raised by the surrounding population from where they came from to cover their supplies. A passage in Doomsday Book suggests that in the later 11th century, each soldier received a pound to cover his needs. So again, we're talking the equivalent of hundreds or thousands of pounds in modern terms. It's difficult to determine the size of armies, but a few thousand each time, more in some cases, is not implausible. Now, London would, of course, have had to contribute to a lot of these payments itself, most obviously in 1018, when it was singled out for a punitively high charge. If fresh coins were required to settle these debts, they would have accounted for a significant part of the roaring business that London's moneyers did. Alternatively, the moneyers themselves could have taken on the role of finding silver for those who didn't have it. So, peasants or others who had resources but not cash could go to the moneyers and paid them some other commodity in return for the crucial coins. All of this would also have been true of other mint towns across the country, but what made London stand out 
was the role it played in marshalling and concentrating resources from the rest of the kingdom. In this respect, London's moneyers were almost benefiting from Viking depredations. We know that one of the large tribute payments from the English to the Vikings was definitely assembled at London in 1012. As mentioned above, um, we also uh, know that London hosted fleets and armies from the early 990s onwards. It, was entire, it is entirely possible that other tribute payments were gathered in London, as were other fleets and armies. All the machinery to do that, food, accommodation, clothing, manufacture, and repair of weaponry, must have been concentrated in and giving income to the people of London, even if the coins that were made would often have immediately gone elsewhere. In other words, London's monetary and economic fortunes were closely entwined with its military and political prominence. Strikingly, the number of moneyers and the quantity of coins made at London dropped back around 1060, leaving it once again in the same general league as Lincoln, Stamford, Winchester and York. This is not a symptom of decline in real terms. The archaeology shows that London's overall growth stuck, becoming self-sustaining as the 11th century wore on, but its inflated role in the coinage stemmed from particular and temporary circumstances. The reduced level of minting it fell back to probably stands closer to the level generated by the city itself on a more organic basis, um, it being in, in sort of physical and population terms only somewhat bigger than other major towns of the kingdom by this point. It's grown a lot, but it's still not, not, not quite as much bigger in terms of people as it would be in later times. But another legacy of London's period of dominance that stuck, and which shows how it was still very special, even if the actual quantity of coin did not always stay so high, was a central organizational role that the city had in the making of the kingdom's coinage. Money has minted coins at over 100 locations in England between about 970 and the Norman Conquest. The bulk of these places operated only briefly and on a, on a small scale. Many of them are only known from one or you know, fewer than five surviving coins. But the pennies that they made conform to a sequence of types used across the whole kingdom. That in itself implies close communication between these localities and the royal court where decisions on the coinage were made. Frequently, it, it is also apparent from looking at the coins that the stamps or dies used to make them were produced and distributed from a single source. At other times, regional variants can be identified. These do not generally represent whole different types. Uh, rather, they show, as I put an example of on the slide here, how separate craftsmen might replicate the same underlying design slightly differently. Hence, the bust might be a little bigger, the lettering a little smaller, the hair on the bust a bit bushier, or whatever. Under Ethelred II, distribution vacillated between unified and decentralized. But from about the middle of Canute's reign, maybe the 1020s, um, things became consistently centralized. There is no exact science for identifying the place where particular groups of dyes were made, at least from the coins themselves, but for what it is worth, London is thought to have been one of the main sources, and at times the main source, from the middle of Ethelred's reign onwards, so again roughly the 990s. It also tended to be one of the places most marked by innovative and unusual practices, like the coin of the street names I talked about a moment ago. Another hint comes from cases where the same obverse stamp or die, the one naming and showing the king, was used by two or more moneyers at different mint towns. This is the ultimate piece of numismatic technical nerdery. Intermint die links, as they are called, can only be identified by sifting through thousands of coins and comparing them minutely. It is like trying to match fingerprints manually and to some degree from memory. Anyway, the key discovery here is that a high proportion of these intermint die links involve London. There is more concrete evidence as we move into the reign of Canute and beyond that the making of coin dies was now concentrated in London and that the moneyers from places as far afield as Chester, Exeter and York had to send to London for the dies that they needed. We have, on the one hand, an important archaeological find of four coin dies from the banks of the Thames. The original context of these is frustratingly damaged, 
in that they were found together in a lorry load of spoil from the foreshore that was taken to a field in Kent in the 1980s and there identified by metal detectorists who would zip after the lorries on their mopeds to comb the material for items of interest. So there is no doubt that these coin dies came from London or even from a specific part of London, but nothing in the way of further archaeological context is known, which is a shame. The four dies themselves, however, speak volumes very clearly. They date from the period of Canute to the mid 12th century. All are for the reverse of coins, so carry inscriptions telling us where and for whom they were made. The key thing is that not one die was made for use in London. The earliest was made for money in Norwich, the others for money in Northampton, Southwark and Wareham. These probably represent old used dies that have been made in London, sent to their intended money and then sent back after they were no longer needed, which was normal practice with coin dies, as they were quite literally a license to make money. The movements of obverse coin dies visible through intermint die links represent the same phenomenon, though of course we can only tell when they are combined with reverse dies in different places. Finally, there is Doomsday Book, the detailed survey of landholding in England commissioned in the 1080s, but looking back to conditions just before Edward the Confessor's death at the beginning of 1066. London itself is actually omitted in Doomsday Book, where it probably should have been before Middlesex, there is just a blank page. Modern historians have wondered whether the city's size and tenurial complexity just defeated the survey, or if maybe a separate survey was made and has not survived, as it has for Winchester. Fortunately, there are references to London in entries for other places, um, and some of the most distant and surprising are in the sections for Hereford and Worcester. These comments in discussion of the various payments that inhabitants of the towns had to make in 1066, that the moneyers had to send away to London for their coin dies, costing a pound a time, whenever a new coinage was brought in, which would probably be every sort of five to 10 years. This is proof positive that London was the operational centre of the English coinage, a status that it had gained in the course of the early and mid 11th century as a corollary of its financial importance in the kingdom. It housed the standing mercenary army that received tax every year and served frequently as the mustering point for fleets, armies and a little earlier, tribute payments for the Vikings. All of this fed into London's disproportionate role in minting, which provides a vital material barometer of its evolving status. So London is a great city and it has been for a long time. What I've tried to show here is that its transformation from an important city to a great one can be pinpointed to the late Anglo-Saxon era, specifically to the period after about 990. It was a process closely tied to the military and economic exertions of the English kingdom, which was itself still a fairly new entity finding its feet in testing times as Viking attacks forced the king, his advisors and their officials to take unprecedented action. This is a crucial and underappreciated episode in the city's history, in a sense the basis for everything that followed in terms of its relationship with the rest of the kingdom. London's defensibility and its strategic location made it an ideal focal point for England's efforts against the Vikings. It became closely identified with Ethelred II and his son Edmund Ironside. Paradoxically, this meant that their erstwhile enemy and successor, Canute, also had to pay close attention to the city, even if he was not a fan of it and spent more time in Winchester. London retained its military importance, and under Ethelred's younger son, Edward the Confessor, the city returned to royal favour, grandly demonstrated by Edward's decision to patronise and reconstruct Westminster Abbey, adjacent to London on a really lavish scale. When William the Conqueror chose to head to London to secure his victory and be crowned king, he tapped into very recent precedent and also a tradition going back some 70 years of London being the defining stronghold of the English. It was not yet, strictly speaking, a capital city in the sense of a permanent base for the king and his administration, though nowhere really was in England or really anywhere in, in Northern Europe at this time. But of the capital cities that England did not have, London was becoming established as the most important. Thank you.